ICP water attack. Hello. My name is Jung Yoon, postdoc associate in MIT and founder of ICP water attack. In this video, I would like to introduce this portable desalination unit. Let's go. Needless to say, we are facing a water crisis due to climate change and our own human activity. 785 million people lack access to safe water. Every two minutes, a child dies from a water-related disease. To solve this problem, people have built seawater desalination plants. They are an excellent solution for people in urban areas because of the capital and infrastructure cities have to offer. However, what about people who live in places where desalination plants cannot be built? For example, very small groups who live in on islands remote workers in isolated areas, refugees facing natural disasters, or soldiers carrying out long-term military operations. All of these groups need a secure source of drinking water for basic survival. So, my group has developed a portable desalination system in hopes of delivering safe water to these people. It includes controller, pump, or desalination module. In the desalination module, ICP process takes place. The ICP process is a newly developed desalination technology that can remove both dissolved and suspended solids using electrical power. The production rate is easily scaled by stacking additional spacer and electromembrane units. The state-of-art ICP module requires approximately 20 watt-hour per liter of power consumption to produce drinking water from seawater, which means that it can be operated with batteries that are chargeable by solar panels. Let's see how it operates. Welcome to the Carson Beach. Solar panel, battery, portable desalination unit. Go through the feature. And then turn on the system. Collect the water. What about the next? Just drink it. ICP water attack. My name is Elena Sabrino. I'm a PhD candidate in the History, Anthropology, Science, Technology, and Society program at MIT. What you're seeing right now is an empty space in Flint, Michigan, where a huge automotive factory complex once stood. My research explores how deindustrialization has produced ecological debts that show up today as financial, toxic, and racial injustices. Flint is a Rust Belt city in the Midwestern United States. Surrounded by the Great Lakes, almost 20% of the world's freshwater supply. When you look closely at Flint, however, a paradox emerges. This proximity to abundant natural resources does not guarantee water access or water safety. Flint has been in an ongoing water crisis of toxicity and affordability for years. In my dissertation, I argue that strictly technological water solutions are not enough. I argue that the alleviation of toxic harm is also tied to the elimination of policies and practices that uphold structures of inequality and racism. I compare and contrast cultural, political, and scientific projects that all work to make these structures more visible, but in different ways. On the ground in Flint, I study organized labor movements, environmental justice movements, and green chemistry. Each of these spheres of action offer specific strategies in response to the Flint water crisis. For these groups, the water crisis demonstrates how both the economic and ecological value of water are deeply intertwined. By examining the aims, promises, and limits of these three communities and their approaches to water solutions, my dissertation offers an account of how the categories of the economic and the ecological are themselves opened up to social transformation and contestation. Hi there, I'm Saad from the Underwater Communications team in Signal Kinetics. Our group develops the next generation of ocean IoT technologies. 
which opens up new and exciting possibilities for exploring and monitoring underwater environments. Specifically, we create underwater sensors that allow us to monitor climate, marine life, localize objects of interest, or even to monitor aqua farms to support the growing food demand around the world. What's more, well, you can do all of this in a power efficient manner since our sensors don't require any batteries. In this video, I'll be telling you about the technologies that our group has developed to enable ultra low power underwater backscatter communication. Let me tell you about some of the challenges in building these technologies. The first challenge is that all underwater communication relies on sound signals, which drains a lot of power. This is because in order to communicate, all underwater nodes need to transmit their own signal. Our group developed the first technology that can achieve the same level of communication by consuming one million times less power than existing underwater sensors. The main idea is to reflect the existing acoustic signals in order to communicate which is known as backscatter. And to top it off, we do it without using any batteries because we harvest energy from the existing acoustic waves and use them to power up our sensors. This is not all. We used this technology and showed a communication range of 10 meters and a throughput of 3 kilobits per second, which is sufficient to monitor ocean vitals such as temperature and pressure. This year, we built a new transducer, which gave us 6 times improvement in throughput and 5 times improvement in range. We tested our system in the Charles River and got promising results. We are very excited to explore these technologies in the future, and we hope that our work will help to revolutionize the ocean IoT domain. Feel free to reach us if you'd like to learn more about the technologies. Thank you for watching this video. Hi, I'm Kritika, a recent graduate from Professor Karnik's group at MIT. I would like to present my team's work on developing low-cost water filters using plant xylem. Microbial contamination of drinking water is a cause of global health concern. The use of household water treatment can reduce the burden of waterborne diseases. However, the adoption of existing technologies in low-income settings has been impeded by four key barriers, access, affordability, social acceptance, and awareness. We have developed a potential solution to this problem using the xylem tissue in non-flowering plants. The xylem, which is present in the barks and the trunks, has a rather unique structure. It comprises of conduits with sealed ends that are interconnected through pores present along the walls. The pores in the xylem are much smaller than the size of several waterborne pathogens. So the question we asked was whether we can use these pores to remove contaminants present in the water. Through years of research, we have developed a simple two-step process for fabricating practically useful xylem filters. This involves cutting the wood, peeling off the bark, soaking it in hot water for an hour, soaking it in alcohol overnight, and then eventually drying it. Filters can then be mounted in a device and operated using gravity. In terms of performance, the permeance of xylem filters is comparable to commercial filters with equivalent pore size, and their flow rates can be tuned by adjusting filter area and pressure. The capacity of these filters varies with the filter geometry, water quality, and use of pre-filtration. At the very least, these filters can cater to the daily drinking water requirements of an average household and might need replacement on a daily to a weekly basis. As per the WHO's classification scheme for water treatment technologies, xylem filters can provide comprehensive protection against waterborne pathogens. We have conducted field studies in India to validate the technology, fabricate filters locally, and gather user feedback. Through a user-centric design approach, we have developed functional prototypes that can incorporate xylem filters. Due to the abundant availability of wood, its cost-effectiveness, biodegradability, and traditional familiarity, these filters could lower barriers to access, affordability, and social acceptance. This is an open source technology. We have created a web portal to guide parties interested in taking this technology to the users and will be launching it soon. I would like to thank my team members, collaborators, and the project sponsors for supporting our work.
Thank you. Heavy metal contaminants in water, including arsenic and lead, occupy four of the World Health Organization's 10 chemicals of major public health concern for their threat to human health. In places without centralized water treatment infrastructure, point-of-use water treatment technologies rely primarily on heavy, difficult-to-distribute bucket systems. These systems use bulky materials with low surface areas to absorb heavy metals, which limits their effectiveness. Today, there is a critical need to develop miniaturized, easy-to-use heavy metal remediation technologies to address what scientists call humanity's biggest mass poisoning. Small molecule assemblies, like the cell membrane, offer tunable surface chemistries and enormous surface areas, allowing scientists to do more chemistry on less material. In fact, these nanostructures offer seven orders of magnitude more surface per mass than bulk materials in use today, making them an ideal system for water treatment applications. However, these structures are usually fragile because the forces which hold them together are weak. To overcome this limitation, we develop the Aramid Amphiphile platform. Aramid Amphiphiles incorporate a Kevlar-inspired structural domain to provide robust interactions within the nanostructure. We observe aramid amphiphiles spontaneously form nanofibers in water, with mechanical properties rivaling silk. Using this structural stability, we can draw nanofibers into macroscopic threads and dry them, for the first time extending small molecule assemblies to the solid state. To use the aramid amphiphile design to remove heavy metals from water, we designed their surfaces to have an extremely high affinity for contaminants. We demonstrated these nanofibers can remove lead in amounts exceeding one-tenth the weight of the nanofibers, survive in extreme environmental conditions, and are easily scaled to large quantities. Aramid amphiphile materials offer a promising route to producing next-generation miniaturized technologies for water treatment. Hello and welcome to this video. A dilemma is a situation requiring a choice between two or more equally undesirable alternatives. Join me in this video on a journey to Egypt to talk about water sector challenges concerning the irrigation of rice. Egypt is an agricultural nation located in North Africa, a region suffering from extremely limited per capita re renewable freshwater resources. A combination of explosive population growth, rising food demands, and limited water resources are posing enormous pressure on, the far on farmers to produce more food with less water. Rice is a good example of this dilemma. It's a staple food in the Egyptian diet, an important source of employment, and a strategic food security crop with great ecological value. But it's also highly water intensive in a situation where agriculture is already the sector with the highest freshwater withdrawals nationwide. The situation became even more complex with the construction of a massive hydropower dam in Ethiopia in 2018, which triggered a wave of concern to downstream neighbors, Egypt and Sudan. Rice became the immediate target of water rationalization policies that mandated cuts of over 50% in cultivated areas. However, farmers did not comply, leading to forceful removal of cultivations by state officials. While many initiatives scrambled to devise technical solutions, this project was more interested in understanding why the new water policy was not working. To answer this question, I spent months visiting rice fields, research centers, reviewing policy documents, and interviewing various stakeholders. I was able to identify three cases for in-depth analysis. Mapping was instrumental in finding out why farmers did not comply. Through combining different layers of analysis, an interesting correlation between population density, poverty, and incompliance was observed. Interviews further revealed that most farmers in these dense areas cultivated rice for subsistence out of poverty. Mapping also helped identify discrepancies between different scales of action, 
In other words, reductions were allocated collectively without accurate reflection of water district divisions on the ground. In summary, the project indicates that the policy did not achieve desired results because socioeconomic conditions and implementation factors were not properly addressed. The project hopes to highlight the importance of policy analysis in addressing water sector challenges in irrigation, particularly in the coming years as pressures on water for irrigation continue to mount. Thanks for watching. We often talk about climate change in the future tense, projections of global mean temperature and sea level rise warning us that our past consumption of fossil fuels threatens our current ways of living, and that if we can achieve carbon neutrality by some agreed upon date, that we can sustainably support the amenities of modern life we depend on. But in 2021, as we emerge from the warmest decade on record on the heels of unprecedented climate-driven disasters that threaten basic access to clean water and electricity, it should be obvious that the climate has changed and that the language of our sustainability goals tends to ignore the billions of people already suffering. At the same time, trash is accumulating in landfills and with each new natural disaster, these piles surge in size as their management is relegated to the global south. We consider disposal to be the end of the value chain, but what if instead we could develop technologies that transform our waste into critical resources that add value at the local level? Aluminum is especially undervalued. It is abundant, cheap, and also highly energy dense, packing nearly double the energy of gasoline for the same volume. Aluminum will react with water, releasing roughly half of this energy as heat and the other as hydrogen gas. Aluminum's natural oxide layer prevents this reaction from occurring, but we found that a minimal surface treatment of gallium and indium allows the reaction to proceed at the aluminum grain boundaries. We have shown that a similar process can be applied to actual scrap aluminum without needing to remove paint or other impurities. Producing fuel from used beverage cans, for example, requires less than 2% of the fuel's embodied energy and consistently achieves 97% theoretical hydrogen yields. To perform desalination, we developed a system in which the aluminum fuel and water are reacted in an enclosed container where the heat and hydrogen generate high pressures capable of driving reverse osmosis. We can then produce electricity from the hydrogen via a fuel cell or internal combustion engine, and once complete, the gallium and indium used to activate the aluminum can be recovered to generate new fuel and the cycle repeats. The reaction's aluminum oxyhydroxide byproduct is itself a valuable commodity due to its various industrial uses. We showed that around the world, the combined value of the potable water, electricity, and hydroxide far exceed the base price of the initial scrap aluminum. This technology therefore has the potential to improve vulnerable communities' resilience to climate change by giving them the ability to economically generate critical resources from materials that would otherwise be considered waste. Hi, my name is Hilary Johnson, and I work on inventing mechanisms and tools to improve the efficiency of centrifugal pump systems. Pumps are integral to your daily life. Centrifugal pumps move fluid through our industrial and municipal systems, including clean water distribution, wastewater treatment, crop irrigation, and pumped hydro energy storage. Centrifugal pumps consume 6% of total U.S. electricity each year, equivalent to the annual energy output of 56 Hoover dams. Currently, a significant source of inefficiency is that pumps have limited adjustment to meet the demand for variable flow in these applications. The Department of Energy estimates that 10 to 20% of energy could be saved by operating at the best efficiency point. Using fluid fundamentals and experiments, I showed that varying the pump geometry in response to fluctuating flow enabled best efficiency operation across a range of flows. Then. Using precision machine design principles, I invented a dynamic pump mechanism which expands the pump during higher flows and contracts during lower flows. Our patent pending mechanism adapts to the optimal geometry for best efficiency. The current prototype I'm testing enables a 6x increase in operational range. Xylem, a leading water company, envisions this variable volume mechanism as the first in a new category of adaptive pump geometry. Adaptive hydraulic mechanisms are one pillar of my broader research mission to build a suite of design tools to improve the energy efficiency of pump systems. My work includes analytical tools to calculate a pump's lifetime efficiency operating with variable flow demand, 
articulating the fluid dynamic fundamentals of entropy gain and energy loss in pumps, and developing statistical and machine learning tools to analyze large wastewater pump data sets. I quantified immediate actions for a major utility to save 800,000 kilowatt hours annually, leveraging my tools on 32,000 data points from 10, 2,600 kilowatt pumps. Working at the Water Energy Nexus, I see how climate change mandates efficient, adaptable, and resilient pump systems. I strive to build analytical tools and invent new technology with potential for terawatt scale. A hearty thank you to my advisors and partners, Xylem, for your collaboration. I'm Andrew Bauma, a PhD student in mechanical engineering at MIT. I study water treatment and water desalination, and I'm also very concerned about drinking water sustainability. Many people make drinking water choices that are unsustainable, and this can often be because of common misconceptions. After talking to a lot of people about their drinking water choices, some common reasons mentioned for choosing one drinking water choice over another include cost, taste, and health and safety concerns. With help from the MIT Water Club, I set up a booth at the MIT Water Night and again at the Cambridge Arts River Festival to talk to anyone and everyone about water choices and to shed some light on the impact of bottled water. A few key facts. In terms of health and safety, both bottled and tap water are very safe, although they are tested by different agencies and tap water has stricter testing requirements. Bottled water can cost a thousand times more than tap water and can take a thousand times more energy than tap water to get from the source into a bottle shipped chilled and into your home. Globally, there are over a million plastic drinking bottles sold every minute. Most of these will end up in landfills or in the ocean. Now all this is great, but there's still one big reason that a lot of people claim is the reason they choose bottled water over tap. Taste! So in addition to highlighting some of these stats, we also set up a blind taste test. Four identical jugs, four kinds of water. A premium bottled water, Evian. A basic bottled water, Poland Spring good old Cambridge tap water, and the wild card, recycled wastewater. We can throw facts at people all we want, but sometimes hearing stats doesn't have the same impact as having a taste for yourself. So we asked people to try to guess which jug was which and to tell us which was their favorite. When we asked people to guess which was which, only 11 out of 242 people guessed all four correctly, which is about what you'd expect if you were picking randomly. In terms of taste, the top tasting water was a tie between the premium Evian water and recycled wastewater. The lower end bottled water and tap water tied for third and fourth just behind the top two vote getters. When we asked people what their favorite was, probably the most common response was, I don't know, they all just taste like water. So in conclusion, drinking bottled water has a destructive impact on the environment. It costs a lot more than water from the tap. It uses a lot more energy to get to you. And if you're like most people, you probably can't taste the difference. Tap water is safe, cost effective, sustainable, and it tastes like water. Hi, I'm Su Che Ting from the MIT Synthetic Biology Center. Today, I would like to share with you a project I've been working on to build a water secure future. Water quality monitoring is very important. However, current water sensing technologies rely on expensive equipment and trained professionals. There is a need for cheap and portable alternatives for uses in resource-limited areas. In nature, plants and animals grow functional materials, such as leaves and skins, that can sense and respond to water quality changes. Can we engineer and replicate these materials in a cheap and sustainable way? For a very long time, scientists have been dreaming about growing a house or even an iPhone from engineered microbes. However, the best technology today can only produce a biofilm that's thinner than a piece of paper. Inspired by the fermented tea drink kombucha, we created a synthetic symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast, SYNSCOBY, that can grow a thousand times more materials for water quality sensing. Inside SYNSCOBY, we have bacteria that can produce a lot of cellulose, which is what makes up trees and paper. We also have yeast cells, which are commonly found in beer and bread, that help with the bacteria's growth. 
we use genetic circuits to make the yeast cells into biosensors for water contaminants, just like how we run computer programs. We make a library of Zinscobi materials that can sense water pollution to remove contaminants. By making metal binding proteins, you can make filters for heavy metal removal. Under an electronic microscope, it, the yeast cells look darker due to copper accumulation. All you have to do is put in a piece of Zinscobi into tea and sugar and leave it on your kitchen table. Zinscobi will grow into a smart filter in three days. This is as easy as making kombucha tea. So all of the 800 million people without clean water can grow one at home. We envision Zinscobi to be directly applied in developing smart filters, packaging materials, self-cleaning textiles, and materials for biomedical uses in the near future. Simscobi, a sustainable technology for growing smart sensors at home. Hi everyone, my name is Ankita. I'm Deb. We are working on a project called UV Gel, which is aimed to provide low cost water disinfection solutions using UVC light for rural India. 
So in the following video, we're going to tell you a little bit more about our project, show you our prototype, and look at some of the preliminary results. Let's get started. We began working on this project when we saw that there was a real need of low-cost water disinfection solution in the rural parts of India. The school shown in this video is one of our pilot trial site where we will be deploying our UVC-based water disinfection unit. So how does ultraviolet disinfection work? Well, we know that the sun emits a range of ultraviolet radiation, the shortest wavelengths of which are considered UVC. Now UVC is considered germicidal, which means it can disinfect water. It does this by altering the DNA structure of bacteria and viruses, rendering them unable to reproduce and therefore harmless to humans. The ideal wavelength to disinfect water is 254 nanometers. So for our prototype, we used a waterproof bulb with a UVC filament and housed it inside one and a half inch PVC pipe, which would be readily available in India. Here we assemble the prototype, starting with the inlet, then moving to a UVC chamber into which we insert the UVC bulb. Water will flow through this chamber, then through a reducer to a three quarter inch pipe and a control valve, which allows us to regulate the flow of water through the system. We then test water that we've run through the system for E. coli and total coliforms. One test, the ECC vial, was developed at MIT, produced in Nepal, and is currently being sent to India to be used by the residential schools. Here you can see the results of some of our preliminary experiments, all of which continue to show the presence of fecal coliforms. After some trial and error, we were eventually able to achieve disinfection of contaminated water sources using a flow rate of two liters per minute. Moving forward, we continue to refine our prototype and create documentation and training materials so that these disinfection units can be replicated on the ground in India. By 2050, 6 billion people will lack access to clean drinking water. Why? Increasing demand and an unreliable supply. Water desalination will be a part of the solution. We can purify salty water and make it drinkable. Reverse osmosis, or RO, is the dominant desalination technology. In this process, pressure drives fresh water through a membrane that rejects salt particles. However, RO is still expensive due to its high energy consumption. Several years ago, there was a lot of excitement over graphene membranes. People thought it could reduce energy costs by 100 times. Unfortunately, that breaks the laws of physics. Thermodynamics tells us that there's a least work of separation to remove salt from seawater. That's the best you can do. No way around it. At MIT, we've been developing a new RO process, batch RO. It doesn't reduce energy by 100 times or even 10 times, but remember that's not possible. It could make water desalination more affordable and sustainable. So our research group started exploring this idea. Emily wrote a model to predict energy consumption and water production. She and other students also invented a bladder-based batch RO system. Their results showed that batch RO could save 20% energy, but this was still just an idea on paper. Would the design work? Were the models accurate? My team got this batch RO prototype system up and running. We also confirmed the accuracy of batch RO models. With most technologies, real life performance falls short of theoretical expectations due to practical losses. So we investigated the practical losses in batch RO. Some can be designed around, others we have to live with. After accounting for these losses, we found that batch RO would save 10% energy. Now we're getting more realistic. At the end of the day, it comes down to money. Will batch RO help someone make money or save money? If the answer is yes, there might be a business opportunity. What next? Exit the lab and spin out. Tough tech startups work to bring promising technologies to the market. It's a long and hard journey, and most fail to cross the valley of death. Why do so many try? It's the best shot of getting technology out of the lab and into the real world where it can make an impact, helping to address the problem that motivated these researchers from day one.
Hello everyone, my name is Lanan Zhang. I'm a fifth year graduate student working with Professor Evelyn Wang at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. My research is about developing the ultra high efficiency solar desalination technique to address a water shortage. As you may know, the water scarcity is a severe global challenge, since a huge number of the world's population is affected by the water shortage problem as shown in this picture. For this reason, the clean water supply and thermal management had become one of 17 sustainable development goals launched by the United Nations in 2018. In fact, there are already many large-scale desalination plants operated worldwide to extract clean water from seawater. However, as shown here, the distribution of desalination plants is not uniform. This is because such large-scale facilities require centralized installation and well-established infrastructure which is actually inappropriate for the applications in rural areas and off-grid regions. For this reason, to enable the sustainable water production, we developed this thermally localized multi-stage desalination. This is a completely passive desalination technology which can be operated under the natural sunlight. As you can see from A, the solar energy is localized at the interface between a solar absorber and capillary wick. The liquid water is passively driven by the capillary weight and evaporates. After vapor condensation, the clean water can be collected, and the latent heat released during the vapor condensation can be reused by the following stage to drive more evaporation through its multi-stage architecture, as shown in B. By using this technique, it is possible to achieve manifold enhancement of the water production rate. Driven by this idea, we develop a 10-stage prototype as shown on the left-hand side. This prototype is based on simple materials such as nylon frame, paper towel as an evaporator, and alumina as a condenser. The total material cost of this unit is only about $1.5. As shown on the right-hand side, we operated this prototype under the natural sunlight. Here we demonstrated a record high solar vapor conversion efficiency and water production rate above five liter per meter square per hour. We hope this technique can be useful for the sustainable water production solution. For this project, I would like to acknowledge Professor Wang and MIT J. Wong Fellowship support. I would also thank my collaborators from our lab, from Professor Ru Zhuang's group at Shanghai Jiao Ping University and Professor John Linhart's group at MIT. Thanks for your attention. Water is a precious resource, but also a scarce one. Despite this scarcity, we continue to pollute it, and its overall consumption has not ceased to grow. The current system is not working. We need a new approach to ensure the preservation of this precious resource. How can we reimagine a new water management paradigm? Currently, decisions on water management are made by governments, sometimes together with the private sector and civil society. But what would, it, what would happen if nature is invited to the table? What would happen if nature is made a subject of rights? These are the type of questions that we are trying to answer at MIT. On one hand, we're looking into the legal implications that making nature a, su a subject of rights will have triggering change in our current system. We're also looking into the ways in which this paradigm can contribute to the design of adaptive water management plans that will prevent conflict at the community level. Finally, we want to explore how does this further strengthen the already existing research on complex systems approaches to water management. The potential for impact of this research is multifold, as it challenges our current assumptions and approaches to the management of water. This research has the potential to provide new ways of ensuring the sustainable development of our communities while ensuring the protection of nature. It will contribute new sought after answers to questions on the implications that adopting this paradigm has in practical terms and will untap new frontiers in the journey towards a more holistic approach to decision-making 
that is truly sustainable in the long run for us as humans and for our planet. Hi, I'm Patricia, and I'm here with my colleague Philippos to present you our work on removing micropollutants from water called 3D Water Biofab. Micropollutants are nasty chemicals because they are present at trace concentrations in water bodies. They end up in drinking water sources due to their non-biodegradable nature. Exposure to micropollutants has adverse impacts on the environment and human health. They can be organic or inorganic as heavy metals. We focus on inorganic micropollutants because they have higher concentrations as they are already present in ecosystems and can be acutely hazardous. Lead is one of the most abundant and toxic heavy metals. It can enter drinking water due to inadequate treatment or through plumbing components. After various incidents of lead contamination, relevant water regulations are being revised. According to the US Environmental Protection Agency, no level of lead in drinking water is safe. Conventional treatment processes either fail to remove trace metals or result in significant energy consumption, increased costs, and toxic byproducts. To overcome these drawbacks, we have developed a bioprinting platform for advanced lead biosorption. Biosorption is the process of capturing heavy metals from biomass. The biomass substrate that we are using is the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae due to its high affinity with lead and unique nature. We cultivate and lyophilize yeast cells to turn them into powder. Using these cells, we have managed to effectively remove lead at the challenging micropollutant levels. We have also discovered that the cell walls after exposure to lead are more electron dense, proving that they can capture lead. Building on these promising results, we combined bioabsorption with biomaterial science and 3D bioprinting to create a new paradigm for scalable water treatment. We pattern millions of cells uniformly in three dimensions, enabling the fabrication of functional biomass. With this approach, we can effectively scale the lead bioabsorption process. To accomplish our goal, we have built a custom-made printing system that allows us to design and fabricate complex architected 3D lead removing structures. Our research sheds light to the poorly understood bioabsorption mechanisms at the micropollutant level and helps us realize our vision for a scalable and low-cost technology to purify water almost anywhere. Thank you. Hi, my name is Grace Connors and I research the best way to combine renewable energy with groundwater desalination. Groundwater is growing more saline as aquifers around the world, including here in the US, are being overextracted to keep up with water demands of the growing population. In the same areas where groundwater is being overextracted, there is an excess of solar energy. Because groundwater desalination happens inland, there is a need for high recovery desalination solutions to minimize brine production. One potential solution is photovoltaic electrodialysis, or PVED. ED has a lower specific energy than RO at lower salinities more typical of groundwater. The challenge is that a typical solar irradiance profile looks like this. But the power demanded by a batch electrodialysis system looks like this. The pumping power, shown in blue, is constant throughout the batch, and the energy required to move ions is higher at the beginning of the batch, where the concentration is higher, and as the concentration decreases, so does the power needed for ion removal. When we overlay the two, we end up with this. There is a total mismatch between the power supplied by the solar panels and the power needed by the desalination process. In order to rectify this, we implement time-varying control to achieve this. We match the solar power available to a unique flow rate and voltage that maximizes the desalination rate of ED. However, when we experimentally demonstrated this time variant control, we learned that as we increase the power, the water production does increase, but so does the specific energy consumption of that water production. Therefore, there is a need for an optimal control strategy to determine how much energy to use directly and how much to store for later use to desalinate at a lower specific energy consumption. We have built this control strategy to optimize the energy management. Then, using this control strategy, we can perform system optimizations using weather data to determine the lowest cost system design that will reliably produce enough water each day. 
Therefore, we can design systems tailor-made for the geography and local context. We have shown that by using the system optimization design tool, we can design systems with a lower levelized cost of water and 100% reliability as compared to on-grid RO systems. Through an improved control strategy and design optimization, I hope to improve the reliability of renewable energy desalination. Thank you. With the intensification of aquaculture, disease outbreak are one of the most significant threats to a successful and sustainable marine production. We are predicting and preventing diseases in aquaculture by monitoring the marine microbiome. Seaweed has a potential as a sustainable food for feeding the growing world population. As it grows, it absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and the ocean, acting as a carbon sink fighting against climate change. When combined with existing fishery, it can absorb excess nitrogen runoff, preventing dangerous algae boom and protect our coastal habitat. Disease, pests, and climate stressors are major challenges to seaweed farming, especially for small shareholders where their entire crop can be wiped out by a disease outbreak within weeks. A particular devastating disease known as ice ice disease causes an ice-like appearance once it is noticed, the damage is already done. It has the potential to wipe out the entire crop within 24 to 48 hours. It is caused by opportunistic bacteria that infects the host. Our project is to develop a low-cost device to detect and prevent diseases before it affects the livestock. And we're doing so by monitoring the microbiome. In a healthy microbiome, harmful bacteria is kept in check by the other microbes. However, when the hose is packed in a crowded environment or when an unexpected climate stressor occurs, it gives opportunity for the harmful pathogen to multiply and grow and infect the hose. We plan to monitor and find the moment when the hose and the microbiome is in danger of being overrun, and we're doing so by using digital holographic microscope to monitor the population and the distribution of microorganisms with the 2D holographic images, we're putting it through a machine learning network that creates a representation. We determine the relationship between the microbiome and the health of the livestock. Our system will be non-disruptive in real time, and also physically and economically scalable. If any area is showing a potential danger to outbreak, we will be able to alert a farmer and take preventative action. We are combining the monitoring system with a set of environmental sensor and a communication platform. We are looking forward to the infill deployment and the implementation of our system by the end of the year. The inside application could potentially benefit the entire aquaculture industry and move us towards a more sustainable ocean. The water we drink is, unfortunately, not as clean as we would like it to be. We now know that water which might otherwise seem clean actually contains emerging contaminants which are toxic to humans over long periods of time. These contaminants or micropollutants come from many different sources and, not being very soluble in water, are typically present in low concentrations. Some of them have become infamous in recent times, but unfortunately, there is no good solution to this problem. The main method used to eliminate micropollutants today, activated carbon adsorption, typically eliminates only 30% of the micropollutants present in water. It is also unsustainable and carbon intensive, requiring high temperatures to produce and regenerate. We at the Doyle Lab have been working on developing a new material to remove emerging contaminants from water in an affordable and sustainable way. Thinking about making a cleaning agent, we were inspired by common soap. Soap contains long molecules called surfactants, which have a hydrophilic or water-loving part and a hydrophobic or water-hating part. These water-hating parts tend to stick together and avoid contact with water, forming aggregates called micelles when water is added to soap. In fact, this is how soap works. The hydrophobic micelle cores help carry away oily substances that don't mix well with water alone. 
we created polymer gels to which these micelles are chemically bonded. Water flows through, micropollutants which aren't very water soluble latch onto the micelles and we get clean water. Molecular simulations helped optimize the design to improve the amount and speed of pollutant removal. This is a clean way of purifying water and produces no waste water like that produced by reverse osmosis. Our materials remove more micropollutants than activated carbon, faster than activated carbon. These materials can also be regenerated at room temperature with inexpensive chemicals and be reused. All this has given us confidence that this is an affordable way of cleaning water. We have also been interested in scaling up this method, designing and creating industrial units that clean large volumes of water at low cost. So far, we have been using microfluidics to make millions of tiny polymer particles, much smaller than a penny, to speed cleaning of batches of water. Thanks to everyone in the Doyle Group, JWAFs, MGHPCC, and MIT. Hello, I'm Huan Huan Tian from the Busan Group in the Department of Chemical Engineering at MIT. I work on separation by shock electrodialysis, or shock ED. Shock ED is an emerging electrochemical process for water purification. It uses the new physics of deionization shock waves in pulse media. This is a schematic of the current shock ED prototype. As we can see, the main component is a weakly negatively charged macroporous material sandwiched between two cation exchange membranes. When current is applied to the system, the ions tend to go from the cathode to the anode but get blocked by the membranes, while cations can move freely across the membranes. When the current is higher than the diffusion limiting current, a deionization shock can propagate from the cathode side to the anode side leaving behind a deionization zone. Therefore, we can put a splitter at the outlet to separate the phase stream into a brown stream and a fresh stream. This figure shows the real shock ED device that we made in our lab. This fridge is a microporous material and has dimensions of centimeters. In 2015, Schlumberg et al first proved that shock ED can remove over 99% of some binary electro electrolytes. Later on, Conforti shows that uh, magnesium can be more removed compared with sodium from electrolyte mixtures. Then, Akahara et al. shows that shock ED can descend into seawater and effectively remove radionuclides from nuclear wastewater. These experiments show that certain ions especially multivalent cations, tends to be more removed from electrolyte mixtures. The outlet concentration can differ tenfold. This selectivity can make shock ED superior to other water treatment technologies in dealing with harmful trace ions, which are mostly multivalent. However, the mechanism of this selectivity is still not clear. I'm currently working on series to investigate selective ion removal. Preliminary, uh, preliminary results indicate that magnesium is more removed compared with sodium, which is qualitatively consistent with experiments. Meanwhile, we are also doing experiments to see the performance of shock ED on removal of heavy metal ions. Finally, we want to optimize the process. Thanks for watching this video. If you are interested, welcome to contact me at this email. Thanks. I'm Joan R. Spielberg, a fifth year PhD candidate in the International Development Group at MIT Dust, and today I'll present a brief overview of my research on the topic of water delivery in challenging environments, which JWAS has generously supported. Rapid population growth over the next few decades will likely require doubling agricultural production. Doing so sustainably will demand using water efficiently, or what's been called more crop per drop. 
This becomes all the more imperative due to climate change, which alters water availability, among other things. In places like Senegal, a coastal Sahelian country in West Africa, farmers face numerous environmental challenges. These include, among others, desertification, saltwater intrusion, and irregular water availability. Smallholder farmers in particular remain vulnerable to climate risks and face significant resource constraints. Realizing development objectives requires, in part, that these farmers secure adequate access to water. Irrigation is one key way to achieve these development objectives and improve the lives and well-being of smallholder farmers, particularly in Africa. Since the 1980s, Participatory Irrigation Management, or PIM, has been the main policy for improving irrigation management in the developing world. PIM entails the transfer of responsibility for irrigation system operation to farmers. Most often, the transfer is partial, with the government still playing a role. After more than four decades as a principal policy, however, evidence on the effect of PIM reforms is largely inconclusive. This is in part because most research privileges looking at formal rules and regulations, which overlooks the people and processes that actually constitute PIM. So, to better understand PIM, I instead explore the day-to-day -day interactions between bureaucrats and farmers. This has the benefit of centering those overlooked people and processes and allows me to investigate the material consequences of how farmers and bureaucrats think and act. I conduct my research on PIM in Senegal, specifically along the Senegal River Valley, or SRV, which is Senegal's main agricultural zone. SRV is a particularly good place to study PIM. It's the region with the most irrigated land, the highest concentration of farmers, and irrigation management is shared among numerous government and farmer, farmers organizations, and more. This research draws attention to how water is actually managed, emphasizing the importance of everyday decisions and practices. Policy-oriented studies tend to look at what goes in and what comes out, with far less regard for the process by which policies are translated into results. By looking inside the quote implementation black box and centering people and processes, this research reveals how resources are marshaled to advance workable solutions, with important implications for what kinds of PIM policies are feasible and how water supplies can, in practice, be sustainably and equitably managed.